Okay, class, good morning. Today we have multi voice. So let me give you some words that come out on your speed building. You have ex parte, 34th District Court, post conviction application for writ of habeas corpus. Deborah Fisher, Charles Roberts, Mr. Brown. Texas Department of Corrections, January. You have licensing board application, co-defendants, indication. Is that right? Subsequently, a company, legal arguments, as far as testifying, evidence, nothing further. And so nothing further is, do you know that? No. N-U-R-T? No. N-O-U, whatever I wrote. N-U-R-T? N-U-R-T. Nothing further is N-U-R-T, you all. You're gonna hear that a lot in court, so make sure you pick that up. And then you have district court is D-R-O-U-R-T, D-R-O-U-R-T. And then mar marijuana is Marin and Longe R N, and then imprisonment is I M P R I Z, and then M T. Imprisonment, you have probation shock. It's just pro and then bation, two strokes. You have um, application is P L I X with an asterisk. You have subsequent is squint S Q E N T. Subsequent. And then you have writ of habeas corpus to stroke it out, writ of habeas, no, habeas. How's it spelled? A at the end, E A S. Yeah, <laughs> doesn't even know it's spelled. Habeas corpus. Okay, so writ of habeas corpus. So writ of, and then it's habeas because it's E A S at the end. I don't think so. Should be Should be. And so it starts at 120. I know. Um, oh, excuse me, is K P U M? Excuse me. Let me see if there's one for rid of habeas corpus. Sometimes it's just easier to stroke it out. You know what I mean? Just sometimes for me. No, no rid of habeas corpus. Yeah. I'm sure there's one in that oh, book. Yeah. For habeas corpus. In effect is N E F K T. Assistance is stance with an asterisk. H A E B E S. And um, this is going to be you all. It starts with the court colloquy, uh, talking to Mr. Roberts and Ms. Fishers. And I think it's always colloquy. So you have to identify us as we speak, you all. So it's a little tough. I am the court. Mr. Roberts. Ms. Fisher. The court. Mr. Roberts. Ms. Fisher. And this is going to be 120 for five minutes, you all. multi -board. Starts with myself, the court. We're here in the state of, well, no, excuse me, ex parte Mike Brown Jr. arising out of cause number 547336 from the docket of the 34th District Court. This is a pending post-conviction application for writ of habeas corpus relief that's been referred to this court by the 34th. Announcements of counsel. Deborah Fisher for the state. Charles Roberts for the petitioner, your honor. All right, and Mr. Brown is present. Okay, I believe, let's see. Just in summary, Mr. Brown was originally convicted in, or he pled guilty on November 13th of 1989 in the 34th District Court on a charge of delivery of marijuana and was sentenced on December the 28th of 1989 to a term of 10 years imprisonment in the Texas, then the Texas Department of Corrections. There were some subsequent motions and actions 
in the trial court concerning an initial application motion for shock probation with hearings on January 24th of 1990 and on, and then there was another setting for February 9th of 1990, which apparently was canceled. And Mr. Brown went on to serve some time in the Texas Department of Corrections and then was released on parole and is presently on parole. She is your honor. And I think the two primary aspects of the restraint aspect of the case for habeas corpus purposes are the fact that he is still under restraint through the parole process and is also under an impact with regard to state licensing. Yes, he cannot receive a nurse's license with this conviction, Your Honor. Okay. The licensing board has turned down his application based upon this conviction. The application for habeas corpus relief is alleging that he was in effect deprived of effective assistance of counsel as a result of conflict of interest in the representation of himself and three co-defendants by initially Mr. Jones, and then in actual representation by Mr. Scott, John Scott, who has or who was associated with Mr. Jones at the time. There's some indication that later on, shortly before trial, there was a statement by Ortega to Mr. Brown and the other two co-defendants that an additional quantity of money I don't recall exactly how much at this point. I'm thinking as I recall, it's $10,000 or something along those lines. Is that right? I believe that's the figure, Your Honor. An additional $10,000 had been demanded by Mr. Jones shortly before trial. That Mr. Brown and the other two coughed up some additional funds to meet that demand. That the two affidavits that accompany the application from Mr. Smith and Mr. Tyler indicate that they subsequently became aware that this was something that Mr. Ochoa had cooked up on his own. And that none of that money actually went to Mr. Jones or his associates. With regard to the legal arguments that are being presented, it is contended that Mr. Brown, as I said, was deprived of effective assistance of counsel because Mr. Jones and Mr. Scott, in representing all four co-defendants, were operating under a conflict of interest. Okay, anything you want to add to that on behalf of the applicant? No, Your Honor as far as trying to set the framework for? I believe that that is the framework. What, the complaint is? Okay, state? Nothing further, Your Honor. Okay, are you ready to present some evidence now on that matter? Yes, Your Honor. We would like to call Mr. John Scott. Okay, is he outside? We've got... Okay, and so don't forget outside is O-U-D-Z, outside O-U-D-Z. Um, applicant is P-L-K-T. No. P-L-I-K-T, yes. P-L-I-K-T for applicant. And then you have punishment, P-U-N-T, punishment, P-U-N-T. Okay, and then you have, um, can you do legal arguments in one? No. And then you have associates, you all, is S long O R B T, associate S long O R B T. You have a company is A K P A E N, long A to attach it. And then you have actually is T W long A L, actually. Quantity is Q A U N T, quantity, Q 
Q-A-U-N-T. Is there anything out for that? I don't see anything. No. And then you have effective is E-F-K-T-I-B. This is going to be, oh, representation is R-E-P-G-S, representation, R-E-P-G-S. And this is going to be 130 for five minutes, y'all, 130. We are here in the state of, well, no, excuse me, ex parte Mike Brown Jr. arising out of cause number 54376 from the docket of the 34th District Court. This is a pending post-conviction application for writ of habeas corpus relief that's been referred to this court by the 34th. Announcements of counsel? Deborah Fisher for the state. Charles Roberts for the petitioner, Your Honor. All right, and Mr. Brown is present. Okay, I believe, let's see. Just in summary, Mr. Brown was originally convicted in, or he pled guilty on November 13th of 1989 in the 34th District Court on a charge of delivery of marijuana and was sentenced on December the 28th of 1989 to a term of 10 years imprisonment in the Texas, then the Texas Department of Corrections. There were some subsequent motions and actions in the trial court concerning an initial application, motion for shock probation with hearings on January 24th of 1990 and on. And then there was another setting for February 9th of 1990, which apparently was canceled. And Mr. Brown went on to serve some time in the Texas Department of Corrections and then was released on parole and is presently on parole. He is, Your Honor. And I think the two primary aspects of the restraint aspect of the case for habeas corpus purposes are the fact that he is still under restraint through the parole process and is also under an impact with regard to state licensing. Yes. He cannot receive a nurse's license with this conviction, Your Honor. Okay. The licensing board has turned down his application based upon this conviction. The application for habeas corpus relief is allegedly alleging that he was in effect deprived of the effective assistance of counsel as a result of conflict of interest in the representation of himself and three co-defendants by initially Mr. Jones and then an actual representation by Mr. Scott, John Scott, who was associated with Mr. Jones at the time. There's some indication that later on, shortly before trial, there was a statement by Ortega to Mr. Brown and the other co-defendants that an additional quantity of money, I don't recall exactly how much at this point, I'm thinking as I recall, it's $10,000, or something along those lines. Is that right? I believe that's the figure, Your Honor. An additional $10,000 had been demanded by Mr. Jones shortly before trial. That Mr. Brown and the other two coughed up some additional funds to meet that demand. That the two affidavits that accompany the application from Mr. Smith and Mr. Tyler indicate that they subsequently became aware that this was something that Mr. Ochoa had cooked up on his own and that none of that money actually went to Mr. Jones or his associates. With regard to the legal arguments that are being presented, it is contended that Mr. Brown, as I said, was deprived of effective assistance of counsel because Mr. Jones and Mr. Scott in representing all four co-defendants were operating under a conflict of interest. Okay, anything you want to add on that on behalf of the applicant? No, Your Honor. As far as trying to set the framework for? I believe that that is the framework. What, the complaint is? Okay, state? Nothing further, Your Honor. Okay, are you ready to present some evidence now on the matter? Yes, Your Honor. 
We would like to call Mr. John Scott. Okay, is he outside? We've got witnesses in here that will be testifying. I would like to invoke the rule if there are any witnesses in here that will be testifying. Who else do we have that's going to be testifying? Besides the defendant, Your Honor, there's only two. From the clerk's office? No, right here. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Tyler. Okay, and so you have some words um, that came out. You have with regard, is W-R-A-R-D, with regard. You have, yes, Your Honor, is Y-U-R-N-S, Y-U-R-N. Yes, Your Honor. And then you have um, no, Your Honor, and you are in it. And you are in for no, Your Honor. Make sure you know those, you get those a lot. And then you have um, affidavit, plural is AFDZ. Affidavits, AFDZ, you have, um, let me see if there's one for conflict of interest. No. Okay. And this will be at 140, you all. When I'm saying ex parte, I think you can write ex parte. Yeah, no, EX and then parte. Okay. Ex parte. And then, oh, let me just check one word. Um, if there's one for, do, do you know, Pat, maybe delivery of marijuana? No. No. Yo. Let me see, delivery. Um, no. Delivery room, but not delivery. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be 140, you all. We are here in the state of, well, no, excuse me, ex parte, Mike Brown Jr. arising out of cause number 547336 from the docket of the 34th District Court. This is a pending post-conviction application for writ of habeas corpus relief that's been referred to this court by the 34th. Announcements of counsel? Deborah Fisher for the state. Charles Roberts for the petitioner, Your Honor. All right, and Mr. Brown is present. Okay, I believe, let's see. Just in summary, Mr. Brown was originally convicted in, or he pled guilty on November 13th of 1989 in the 34th District Court on a charge of delivery of marijuana and was sentenced on December the 28th of 1989 to a term of 10 years imprisonment in the Texas then the Texas Department of Corrections. There were some subsequent motions and actions in the trial court concerning an initial application. Motion for shock probation with hearings on January 24th of 1990 and on, and then there was another setting for February 9th of 1990, which apparently was canceled. And Mr. Brown went on to serve some time in the Texas Department of Corrections and then was released on parole and is presently on parole. He is, Your Honor. And I think the two primary aspects of the restraint aspect of the case for habeas corpus purposes are the fact that he is still under restraint through the parole process and is also under an impact with regard to state licensing. Yes. He cannot receive a nurse's license with this conviction, Your Honor. Okay. The licensing board has turned down his application based upon this conviction. The application for habeas corpus relief is alleging that he was, in effect, deprived of effective assistance of counsel as a result of conflict of interest in the representation of himself and three co-defendants by initially Mr. Jones and then in actual representation by Mr. Scott, John Scott, who was associated with Mr. Jones at the time. There was some indication later on 
shortly before trial, there was a statement by Ortega to Mr. Brown and the other two co-defendants that an additional quantity of money, I don't recall exactly how much at this point, I'm thinking as I recall, it's $10,000 or something along those lines. Is that right? I believe that's the figure, Your Honor. An additional $10,000 had been demanded by Mr. Jones shortly before trial and that Mr. Brown and the other two coughed up some additional funds to meet that demand, that the two affidavits that accompany the application from Mr. Smith and Mr. Tyler indicate that they subsequently became aware that this was something that Mr. Ochoa had cooked up on his own and that none of that money actually went to Mr. Jones or his associates. With regard to the legal arguments that are being presented, it is contended that Mr. Brown, as I said, was deprived of effective assistance of counsel because Mr. Jones and Mr. Scott, in representing all four co-defendants, were operating under a conflict of interest. Now, anything you want to add to that on behalf of the applicant? No, Your Honor. As far as trying to set the framework for? I believe that that is the framework. What the complaint is. Okay, state. Nothing further, Your Honor. Okay, are you ready to present some evidence now on the matter? Yes, Your Honor. We would like to call Mr. John Scott. Okay, is he outside? We've got witnesses in here that will be testifying. I would like to invoke the rule if there are any witnesses in here that will be testifying. Besides, who else do we have that's going to be testifying? Besides the defendant, Your Honor, there's only two. From the clerk's office? No, right here. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Tyler and Mr. Smith. Smith, okay. I didn't know their names. I've been referring to you and... And they will sit out in the hall. This particular witness is a mere custodian and I would ask that he remain. Actually, I would like to make... Okay, and so you have words that come out. Um, you have, so $10,000 you all, you can write T-E-N or I would just do the one stroke instead of the one zero. I mean, whatever's best for you. And then $1,000 is T-H-O-U-T-H-D-Z? No. T-H-O-U-D, okay? $1,000, oh, there it is. So 10 and then T-H-O-U-D-Z. And then you have, um, as far as is S-F-A-R-S, S-F-A-R-S, you have, who else is W-H-O-E-L-S, one stroke, who else? And that's it, you all. This is gonna be at 150 and then we'll do your test, you all. We're here in the state of, well, no, excuse me, ex parte Mike Brown Jr. arising out of cause number 54736 from the docket of the 34th District Court. This is a pending post-conviction application for writ of habeas corpus relief that's been referred to this court by the 34th. Announcements of counsel? Deborah Fisher for the state. Charles Roberts for the petitioner, Your Honor. All right, and Mr. Brown is present. Okay, I believe, let's see. Just in summary, Mr. Brown was originally convicted in, or he pled guilty on November 13th of 1989 in the 34th District Court on a charge of delivery of marijuana and was sentenced on December the 28th of 1989 to a term of 10 years imprisonment in the Texas, then the Texas Department of Corrections. There were some subsequent motions and actions in the trial court concerning an initial application, motion for shock probation with hearings on January 24th of 1990 and on and then there was another set setting for February 9th of 1990, which apparently was canceled. And Mr. Brown went on to serve some time in the Texas Department of Corrections and then was released on parole and is presently on parole. He is, Your Honor. And I think the two primary aspects of the restraint aspect of the case for 
habeas corpus purposes are the fact that he is still under restraint through the parole process and is also under an impact with regard to state licensing. Yes, he cannot receive a nurse's license with this conviction, Your Honor. Okay, the licensing board has turned down his application based upon this conviction. The application for habeas corpus relief is alleging that he was in effect deprived of effective assistance of counsel as a result of conflict of interest in the representation of himself and three co-defendants by initially Mr. Jones and then an actual representation by Mr. Scott, John Scott, who was associated with Mr. Jones at the time. There's some indication that later on, shortly before trial, there was a statement by Mr. Ortega to Mr. Brown and the other two co-defendants that an additional quantity of money, I don't recall exactly how much at this point. I'm thinking as I recall, it's $10,000 or something along those lines. Is that right? I believe that's the figure, Your Honor. An additional $10,000 had been demanded by Mr. Jones shortly before trial. That Mr. Brown and the other two coughed up some additional funds to meet that demand that the two affidavits that accompany the application from Mr. Smith and Mr. Tyler indicate that they subsequently became aware that this was something that Mr. Ochoa had cooked up on his own and that none of that money actually went to Mr. Jones or his associates. With regard to the legal arguments that are being presented, it is contended that Mr. Brown, as I said, was deprived of effective assistance of counsel because Mr. Jones and Mr. Scott, in representing all four co-defendants, were operating under a conflict of interest. Okay, anything you want to add to that on behalf of the applicant? No, Your Honor. As far as trying to set the framework for? I believe that that is the framework. What the complaint is. Okay, state? Nothing further, Your Honor. Okay. Are you ready to present some evidence on the matter? Yes, Your Honor. We would like to call Mr. John Scott. Okay. Is he outside? We've got witnesses in here that will be testifying. I would like to invoke the rule if there are any witnesses in here that will be testifying. Who else do we have that's going to be testifying? Besides the defendant, Your Honor, there's only two. From the clerk's office? No, right here. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Tyler and Mr. Smith. Smith, okay. I didn't know their names. I've been referring to you and... And they will sit out in the hall. This particular witness is a mere custodian, and I would ask that he remain. Actually, I would like to make the court file an exhibit in this case... Okay. ...for copying later. If we can agree to that... That's fine. All right. That will be admitted and we'll make a copy of it. And I'll take judicial notice of the contents in the clerk's file. Do you have any problem with the clerks remaining? And so real quickly, let me just give you trial court is T-R-O-U-R-T, -T, trial court, T-R-O-U-R-T. -T. And we'll get ready for your test, okay? We're back and we have your 140 number one multi proper names. You have Marcy Kinderman, Pennsylvania Stock Exchange. So remember Pennsylvania's PA twice with an asterisk. Stock Exchange is STEX, STEX, no, STX. STEX, okay, for Stock Exchange. And it starts in the middle or the very beginning direct examination by Mr. Phillips. I'm Mr. Phillips. The witness. The court. Mr. Phillips. The witness. The court. Okay. And so it's going to start with Mr. Phillips asking the witness questions, unless you have the court, all of the banks asking the witness questions. You flip, put it like that, okay? Um, 140, number one for five minutes multi. Starts with myself, Mr. Phillips. Don't forget your title at the beginning. Did the bank teller, Marcy Kinderman, ever ask you to leave the premises? No. The policeman came inside the bank, and then what happened? Well, about another couple of minutes passed. 
and the two foot patrol men were walking up the street and they passed. As they were passing the bank door, they looked in the bank and they waved and then they came in the bank. Who waved? The police outside or the policemen inside? The two policemen that were walking up the street waved. Did you see anyone inside waving back? No. I was up at the counter, so that makes me about 50 or so feet to the west of them. What next? I waited a couple of minutes or so, and then I walked down past the counter to see, you know. I wanted to see what was going on. Then I stationed myself between the bank door and the door of the teller's door. There's a little bit of separation there. There's distance of maybe about 15 or 20 feet. 15 feet, I would say. Is that bank premises or Pennsylvania Stock Exchange premises? Neither or both? It's actually one whole building. It's all one building. At this time, with your right hand, did you push some leaflets off the counter by accident? I would say no. I just flipped them with my finger on purpose. Did you push them with your finger? Can you describe to me how you did that? As far as I know, I made a motion with my fingers, flicking them, you know, here like this. May the record indicate that the witness has indicated that he flicked them with the backsides of his fingertips. Is that correct? That is accepted. You made this flicking motion in the direction of Miss Kinderman. Across the counter. To the best of your recollection, did your hand extend further towards her direction when you made that gesture? Uh-huh. To the best of your recollection, did any of these leaflets come in contact with her person? Well, they fluttered. I believe that I saw some go as far as her person. Three or four feet across the counter? Is that correct? Yes. Was Miss Kinderman seated or standing at the time? Standing. What was the level of her head in relationship to the top of that partition? She's a fairly tall woman. I would say that her head probably was over a foot above the top of the partition. You indicated she was tall. Can you give me any estimate as to her height, please? I would say she was 5'7 or more. Are you the same height and weight you were in 1982? I may have been about 10 pounds heavier, but that's just approximate. You appear to be rather well muscled. Do you go in for athletic sports of any kind? Have you ever boxed? I hike, skin dive. I participated in boxing in the army. I believe you indicated that after you had pushed, or however you wish to describe it, the leaflets in her direction, you handed her the note ordering her to give you the money in her drawer. She made a motion with her arm and the two of you remained there for approximately 30 seconds before someone else came over. Is that correct? Yes. During this one minute, did you have any conversation with Ms. Kinderman? No. The two of you just stood motionless? Yes. You made no conversation with her at all? Not that I recall. Did you make any other physical gestures towards her of any nature? Not that I recall. At that time, did it appear to you that she was going to continue with any transactions involving your note? Well, I really can't say what it appeared like she was going to do. I was waiting to see what she was going to do. Was there any reason why during that 30 seconds that you could not have gone to another window and selected another teller? Any reason at all? There were no restrictions. She was scared and so was I. And then at this time, after the 30 seconds or so, And we'll get ready for your 140 number two.
Okay, so we have your 140 number two proper names, multi boys, Joe Smith, State of Texas, Mr. Mike Jones, District Attorney's Office, El Paso County, Mike Jones, Mr. Jones, Mike, Subpoena Dushis Tikam, and Rose Martin. And so you have colloquy between Mr. Roberts, the court, and then you have um, direct examination by Mr. Roberts. I am Mr. Roberts. The witness. The court. Mr. Roberts. The witness. The court. Okay. And it starts with the colloquy, you and it starts with Mr. Roberts, myself, talking to the court. And it's for about a page and a half, and then you have direct examination by myself. Five minutes, 140 number two. Your Honor, since my voice is soft, can I sit up a little further? Sure, that's fine. So that the court reporter can hear me. Before you do that, let me, by way of trying to set the framework a little tighter, if we can, let's see if we can get an agreement as to what the legal standard is here. And if either of you disagree, please let me know. Basically, we're looking at two things on this multiple representation conflict of interest. We're looking at whether or not the defendant or the attorneys actively representing conflicting interests and then yes, whether an actual conflict adversely affected their representation. In other words, that's the legal standard. Do you have any disagreement about that? No, Your Honor. Okay, and this is a burden on the applicant? I understand, Your Honor. On both prongs of that test? Yes. Okay, all right. My questioning is really devoted towards that. When did this case begin? Excuse me. Would you state your name in the record? Joe Smith. And you're an attorney here in the state of Texas? Yes, sir. And you were so employed in 1986-87? Yes, sir. I've been licensed to practice law in the state of Texas since April 29th of 1974. And at that time in the 86, 87, 88 era, were you working for Mr. Mike Jones, another attorney? In 86 and 87? Yes. I was working for the district attorney's office. So this would be? Of El Paso County. This would be in 88, right? You began working there. If memory serves me right, Mr. Roberts, and please don't hold me to this, I think I went to work for Mike Jones on June the 1st, 1988. Okay. And I think I was in his employ continuously until February 25th, 1991. Okay. About three years, something like that. And this case came up, what, about 1989? Yes, sir. Okay. And who was hired in this case specifically, you or Mr. Jones? Mike. Mike, who was the one that retained Mr. Jones? You'd have to ask Mr. Jones that. Okay. Did Mr. Jones have some conversations, you know, with the defendants before you got into the case? Oh, I'm sure Mr. Jones talked to the defendants, yes. Okay. And do you recall the exact time frame that you got into the case? Exactly. No, sir. Okay. No, sir. Now, I just remember, you know, Mike would have turned the case over to me uh -huh. because it was a state prosecution. Uh huh. And I would have started doing what you have to do on a criminal case, such as get discovery from the district attorney's office, talk to the clients, get their version of the facts, take whatever legal steps I thought were prudent and necessary. Okay. Now, there are some notes which you have forwarded on to the district attorney's office as part of your affidavit. No, sir. I've not forwarded anything over to the district attorney's office. If you're referring to these notes here? Yes. 
the exhibit to my affidavit? Yes. That was taken from Mr. Jones's file, and I understand that Mr. Jones has turned his file over to the district attorney. I don't have anything. Okay. This is a copy that the district attorney allowed me to look at, and these are, that is my handwriting. Those are my notes. So Mr. Jones just turned his file over to the district attorney's office? I assume he did. I don't know. That's where I saw it. Your Honor, could we get this clarified at this point? We've got some subpoenas out for this file and have had them out for a while, and this may be the reason we do not have a response. I don't have the file, Mr. Roberts. Okay, I understand. A subpoena duces tecum was served on Rose Martin, my secretary, yesterday. Yes. And, but that's okay. If I had it, I would have brought it. Just like I've never been personally served a subpoena in this case, but I've been. Okay, we'll get ready for your 120s, you all. Okay, you all, so we have our 120 multi number one. You have Bias, Mr. Martin, Mr. Val, Bias, Nomas, Martin, Eddie, El Paso, Fred Martins. And it starts in the middle with question by Mr. Thompson. Always Mr. Thompson's witness, unless you have Mr. Curtis speaking to the witness or myself. I'm Mr. Thompson. The witness. Mr. Curtis. Mr. Thompson. The witness, Mr. Curtis. And this is 120 multi voice number one starts with Mr. Thompson asking the witness questions, unless you have Mr. Curtis speaking to either one of us. Five minutes, you all. You mentioned earlier something about construction. What did Bias say about construction? Object to form. That it happened during a moment when the truck jumped or something like that. All right. I'm going to re-ask the question because the attorney on the other side objected. Did Vias say anything to you about construction? Yes, that the truck had jumped in a, in a construction site or where construction was being done. And was Vias saying that when you were talking about how Mr. Martin was injured? Once he was, they were already on their way back and he was driving. I understand. My question is when Mr. Val Bias told us about the construction and the truck bumping or jumping, was he telling you that in relation to talking about Mr. Martin's injury? Object to form. Yes. Do you remember anything else about that conversation between you and Mr. Bias? just that he had to drive back. Why did he have to drive back? Because Martin was already dizzy and he could not. You mentioned something earlier about illegal. Do you know or recall that? That the company had told Eddie that he had to drive all the way to El Paso. That's what Eddie told me. What about that was illegal, if anything? Because it was Martin's shift or turn to drive, but he was not able to. Did you ever talk to Mr. Martin about what happened that day? That very day that Eddie called me. What did Mr. Martin tell you? That he was not able to move his head because he had twisted his neck during the point where a truck jumped or bolted. After that day, did you ever again talk to Mr. Martin about his injury? No, not anymore. Just... I thought no mas means no more. No, no. He says just, or it could be no more. It could be both. So you might want to follow up. Let me ask that question again. After this day that you talked to Eddie and Mr. Martin, 
about this incident, did you ever at any point after talk to Mr. Martin again about his injury or that day? Yes, when he was at the hospital and he was in bad shape. You talked to him while he was at the hospital? Yes. He said that as soon as he arrived, he went straight to the hospital, to the emergency room. As soon as he arrived where? To El Paso, but he wasn't, he wasn't driving then. Was this the same day? No. When did he tell you this? I don't know if it was a week later. Once he had recovered at the hospital when... Okay. Did you ever work with Mr. Martin? Before I was fired. How did you come about to work with Mr. Martin? When the doctor released him and he was ready to work, they were having difficulty in placing him in the company. Why? Because there were comments being made or gossip was running that he wasn't up to running with a team. Object to non-responsiveness. Where did you hear that? Object to form. Amongst the same drivers. Did you hear any comments about Fred Martin's ability to drive a truck? Object to form. When he came back to work? Well, I had met him with me. Prior to him driving with you, did you hear things about Mr. Martin and his ability to drive from the company employees? Object to form. In the same company. What did you hear? Object to form. When I spoke to the owner of the company that he Okay. You also, we have your 120 multi number two, Dr. Golay, Blue Shield, HMO, Blue Shield, Kaiser, Michael Neese, KB Toys. And um, it starts in the middle with a question by Ms. Nash. Always Ms. Nash's witness, unless you have Mr. Switzer speaking to the witness or myself. I'm Ms. Nash. The witness. Mr. Switzer. Ms. Nash. The witness. Mr. Switzer. Okay. And this is 120 multi number two for five minutes starts with Miss Nash asking the questions. Was it after you were married? Yes. And what prompted you to make an appointment with him? Marriage difficulties. What kind of difficulties? Arguments, disagreements that were frequent, incompatibility. Any abuse? No. Did your husband go to these appointments with you? Yes. Well, before we go any further, let me renew my objections stated earlier that this is an unwarranted invasion of privacy. It's not calculated to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence. To the extent this witness is waiving marital privilege, to be asserted by her husband or ex-husband to the question is improper. Let's take a break at this point again. I want to talk to my client. Sure. Can you read back the last question so I can see where we were? How often did you treat with Dr. Galay? Approximately 10 times. And your first visit was after your marriage. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. How many times did your husband attend these visits with you? Every time. Did the sessions usually last approximately an hour? Yes. Did the issue of the child abuse come up at all during these sessions? Not that I recall. Did you and your husband treat with another counselor other than Dr. Galay. We had an occasion to interview a couple different counselors that we were not happy with. Our main counselor that we went to was Dr. Galay. 
Why did you stop seeing Dr. Galay? The decision was made to separate. Was that Dr. Galay's recommendation? That the two part ways? Yes. No. He had mentioned it at one time, but I don't believe that that was his recommendation. His main goal was, as far as I know, to try to keep us together. After you, I'm sorry, what was your answer? My question where I asked you why you stopped treating with Dr. Galay. Jim and I had decided to separate. And also there was the money factor. Were these visits covered through insurance? Partially, yes. What type of insurance did you have? It was my husband's insurance. It was Blue Shield HMO. Did you have that insurance the entire time you were married? Yes. Are you still covered by Blue Shield? No. Do you have any insurance now? Actually, Blue Shield HMO did change, now that I think about it, to Kaiser. So I'm back at Kaiser right now. And is this through your present employer? No, this is still through Jim. Does his company have coverage? No, he is, he is still, he changed jobs and got Kaiser coverage while we were still married. And his new company had Kaiser, is that correct? Yes. And you're on Jim's policy, is that correct? That's correct. Where did you meet Michael Knees? KB Toys. Was he an employee there also? No, he was an employee in the same building, different company. Now, I want to go back and discuss the sexual abuse a little bit, okay? Okay. I don't want to be really specific and make you feel uncomfortable, but I just want to get a general idea about what happened to you, okay? Okay. Now, you stated it started at age four and it began with fondling and oral copulation. Is that correct? Was that your testimony? Yes. Okay, is there anything else that happened at age four that you didn't mention? No. And when you were at that age, you didn't feel that anyone was aware of it. Is that correct? At times I felt that there must be someone in my family that knew. They now agree that they... Okay, you all, so that concludes your tests. Have a great weekend, and remember it's 95% that you need on the multis, okay?